Hi everybody, I'm Katherine Pierce, and I'm the Poet Laureate for the State of Mississippi. Welcome to the Mississippi Poetry Podcast, a podcast where poetry comes alive for listeners. Around the country and the world, poets are writing right now and creating vibrant, important poems that enlighten, entertain, challenge, and comfort. Some of these incredible poets have roots right here in Mississippi. Each episode of the Mississippi Poetry Podcast will feature a different poet with Mississippi connections. We'll hear a poem, learn about how it was written, and chat a bit about poetry and beyond. I'm so glad to have James Dixon on the podcast today. James Dixon is a poet and high school teacher. Now in his 22nd year of teaching high school English in Mississippi, he lives in Jackson with his wife, their son, and a small menagerie of animals. His debut collection, Some Sweet Vandal, was published by Kelsey Books this May, and he once ate $50 worth of food at Waffle House on a dare. So, Jamie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and talking poems with me today. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm always excited to, to talk about poetry. Oh, my pleasure. So, I usually ask a sort of random non-poetry question to start us off, but I was intrigued by the last line of your bio. And so I feel like that's what I need to know more about. Because, I mean, if I'm, if I'm correct, if I remember my Waffle House experiences accurately, $50 is a lot of Waffle House food. It is. And get you a lot of Waffle House. So I had two questions. What was the most delicious part of that $50 Waffle House meal? And at what point did you take a bite of something and think, maybe this was too much? Oh, okay. So uh, I'm going to answer those in reverse order. When the, when the bet started... When the, when the gag started, my college roommate and I and two of his fraternity brothers were the only customers in the Waffle House at Northside Drive in Jackson. Um, and I'm going plate for plate for a while uh, until the, the pork chops showed up. And that that really pumped the brakes, uh, among other things that occurred. Uh, uh, so, yeah, the the. The, the pork chops, definitely. Um, I was surprised to learn that uh, you can order a green salad at Waffle House. Oh, I did not know that. I, I, I did not either, right? Yeah, so so uh, illumination abounds. Um, most of the salads have probably been there since the Carter administration, but, you know, whatever. Um, the, the grilled chicken sandwich was the surprise. Okay. I, was, I was not expecting it. It was really well seasoned. It wasn't dry. Um, it It... It was a a nice, nice counter to the pork chops. All right. Okay. Good to know. All right. Well, thank you. I feel like this is, this is useful information, you know, for everybody. So yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So thank you for that. So what are you going to be reading for us today? Maybe you can set up this poem for just a minute and then go ahead and and read it for us. Gotcha. All right. So I'm going to be reading the the first poem uh, from my book uh, titled Cocapelli was the title of the poem. The Hopi uh, Native American tribe uh, had a, a deity uh, uh, called the Cocopelli, who was in charge of uh, crops, uh, a couple of other things. But, but another thing the Cocopelli was in charge of uh, was harmless mischief. Uh, and I've always loved that that designation, right? Um, and since I've been teaching uh, high school English for 22 years, uh, I cannot think of a better avatar for high school students than a deity in charge of harmless mischief. Uh, I just love the playfulness of it. Uh, so I'm going to read a poem uh, that, that I hope uh, kind of captures that that wonder and mischievousness. Um, all right, so here we go. Cocapelli. Some sweet vandal has coronated the handrail with a chain of woven clover blossoms. I was surprised to see my students leave the helix intact. Avoiding the rail, they leaned under their backpacks, teetering against beauty's uselessness. Thank you for reading that. I love that image of the of the the chain of of blossoms and also just the word helix is such a great word and to just hit on it there in the poem is wonderful. Can you Talk a little bit about the writing of that poem. Share something about um, your inspiration for writing it or something about the craft that you were thinking about as you were composing the poem. Sure. So it's it's based on true events uh, at a school that I taught at 
prior to the one that I'm, I'm here now, there was a great big staircase uh, coming up from the commons area. And, and one day I, I walked out during my planning period uh, to go run some copies. And I saw this chain of clover blossoms, you know, wrapping its way, spiraling its way up the staircase. And I immediately thought only a student could have done this, right? Uh, this is, this is exactly the kind of, you know, kind of sweet little prank uh, that that a high school student would pull off. I had a lot of trouble imagining any faculty <laughs> right, uh, d- doing something like this. And that image just stuck with me. Um, and, and the last image of the poem, the students ascending the staircase, avoiding that handrail and kind of, you know, heatering under the, the weight of their backpacks that weigh just about as much as they do. I thought when the bell rang and and kids started screaming up the staircase, that chain was gone. Right, I was I was mentally writing its elegy, uh, but but they surprised me. Right, uh, they they respected the beauty of this thing um, that was so like fleeting and temporary. Right, uh, the you know they were gone the next day. They probably started wilting and drying out, but just the tenderness right with which these big burly surly you know all of the stereotypes we have about teenagers uh were the you know, the, the tenderness right the the they re- were respecting the fragility of this and it, that really just sort of struck me um so i sort of had that image kind of bouncing around in my head for you know maybe a couple of years just kind of holding on to it right a memory that, that we hang on to uh and then i don't have no idea where i picked up uh the idea of the the coca pelli uh, i was reading something and that came up and my brain just instantly mashed those two things together i was reminded of you know i think the the, the key phrase harmless mischief made me think of the clover chain and i went that's it that's 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 where i'm going with this i i composed the poem in couplets uh to sort of visually reinforce the the sort of fragile nature of the helix right i didn't want you know these big big five line stanzas right i wanted something kind of small uh creating a lot of space on the page just so the image could be by itself and you know even elongated along the page uh kind of like the 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 spiral was elongated up the the handrail yeah so it kind of visually enacts what you're talking about there yeah I love I love your use of the word tenderness in there because that seems exactly right. Yeah, it's this gesture of of tenderness just to let it be. It's such a moving act, right? right? The act of no act, the act of just kind of letting it alone is such a, a beautiful gesture. And the other thing that I really love about this poem is that it's a very spare poem. It's very short. It's very small on the page. And I love that because it seems exactly right for the subject matter, for the sort of the delicacy of this gesture. Um, I think that I could see a poet being tempted to write, you know, this big, long poem about this whole idea and really explaining it and sort of diving into all these different aspects of it. And But I love that the poem resists that and allows it to be this really sort of pure meditation on this moment. And it kind of trusts the reader and itself, the poem trusts itself to say, here's, here's what matters, here it is. And I'm giving this to you and now you can read it and you can have this too. So I just, I love this poem. I think it's a beautiful poem. So thank you for sharing that and talking about it. Oh, absolutely. No, the, the, the spareness is, is something that I, that I, I personally try to strive for. I, I love haiku poets. Uh, you know, Basho and Isa, right? They 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 just give you, you know, this these tiny little chunks of things that are just so big, you know, and, and I I admire that so much and I try and emulate it whenever I can. Well, I think it's definitely coming through in that poem. So what then you're talking about things that you try to emulate as a writer, that kind of gets us into the next question I have for you, which is what is a piece of advice that you would give to poets who are starting out or to poets who are already writing poems, but want to do more of it or find a new way into it? So you know, I'll, I'll kind of circle back to, to what I just said. Uh, beg, borrow, and steal. Uh, imitate, imitate, imitate. You know, when you go shopping for clothes, you try on different clothes, and if they don't fit, you don't buy them. 
Uh, same thing uh, with with writing styles. Um, I love reading uh, long rambling poems. Um, I cannot write those. You know, uh, you know, John Milton or C.D. Wright, even right. Like I, I love reading. You know, these weirdo connections and and you know what's going to happen next. Um, and I've tried writing those and failed spectacularly. Right. I mean, just really amazing uh, how stunningly mediocre uh, my attempts at, at, at that type of writing was. So when I found poets who were were getting there a lot quicker. Right. Uh, you know, again, the, the, the haiku poets, um, you know, I'm thinking of some of like you know, James Wright's later work, uh, you know, just real mm-hmm. dense, uh, you know, the fewer words, the better. Right. Um, I started writing like them uh, and that like like a good pair of jeans or a pair of shoes. It just it just fit me. It felt good in my bones. And I thought, OK, uh, I'm going to trust this feeling and I'm going to continue to try and do this. Uh, I remember um, Mary Carr posted on one of her social media feeds the picture of the computer keyboard she used when she wrote, uh, I think lit and the, the, the backspace key had been used so much that it had broken off, <laughs> you know, and, and that, that really stuck with me, right? Like, you know, for some people revising is going through and adding and changing. Uh, but for other people, and I'm raising my hand here, uh, it's, it's taken a, not an ax, but, but a, some surgical scalpel, Right. You know, and, and whittling it away, uh, you know, Michelangelo said that, you know, the and I'm by no means comparing myself to Michelangelo, but he said the, you know, the sculpture, the sculptures in the marble, I just got to get rid of the extra to find it. And, you know, for me, like for 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 Janie, that's the revision process. Uh, I, I overwrite uh, and then and then I wear that that backspace key out until I'm kind of distilling it down to the. It's it's spare, most refined uh, thing. So you kind of gave us two really good bits of advice there. One is to try different things on, and one is to sort of think about that revision process and how you can use that to get your work as close as it can be to what it ideally is. And I think that those two things go together in such important ways. And I'm thinking about the very first thing you said, which was when you talked about failing spectacularly, which is such a great phrase. And I think that speaks to how important it is to be brave when we write, when we try to write, when we sit down to write something new. Um, The idea of just trying stuff out, trying on different approaches and different forms and, you know, different, different ways to access the poem and knowing that they are not all going to work. A lot of them probably won't work. And that's fine. It's great, actually, because like you said, how do you know if you don't try it on? So that idea of just trying something and failing spectacularly is such a great phrase. I think also because it sounds sort of exciting. Yeah. The idea of failing spectacularly. Like oh, yeah. yeah. Fabulously, yeah. you know, yeah. like, let's just do it. Let's fail in these really amazing ways. Um, it's like, you know, go big or go home kind of thing. And I, I like that. I love that with poetry. Just try something out. And what's the worst that happens, right? You know, the, the poetry cops have not rushed into my house or my classroom uh, and held me down and logged into my Google drive and deleted everything. Right. Exactly. You know? exactly. And, and some of those, some of those spectacular failures are still there because I'm, I'm, you know, maybe foolishly optimistic, but I'm hopeful that I can go back and salvage something, Right. you know, take one line from one train wreck and another line from a different train wreck and then Frankenstein something together. We all have junk folders in our email. I literally have a junk folder in my poetry folder, you know, for, for the stuff that doesn't work, but I don't, I know something can happen with it, but I just don't know what yet. Right. But you hold on to it because it might become something later. I think, I mean, that's, I've also, I've also used that verb to Frankenstein poems together. I've also talked about Frankensteining poems before and you're right. I mean, if you have a line that you like, it may not fit in a certain poem, but 
that doesn't mean it won't fit in some future poem. You just kind of hold on to it and bide your time and it might work out somewhere else. So yeah, well, thank you. I, I agree with all of that. So one more question for you, which is where can we find more of your work if we'd like to read some more poems by you? Um, here's the same look, shameless self-promotion. Uh, the book Some Sweet Vandal uh, is available uh, at you know local local bookstores. Uh, you can get it at uh, from Amazon or from Kelsey Books. Uh, it's K-E-L-S-A-Y Books, uh, direct from the publisher. I don't remember you know, individual, uh, publications for, you know, online where you can find my books, I mean, find my poems, but, you know, a quick Google search will pull up some stuff. Uh, and there's nothing really untoward about me on the internet. So, you know, you could, uh, you know, if teachers, if you're listening, you can search for me on your school computer and the IT department will not come track you down. Good to know. I'm sure everybody appreciates that, that heads up. So thank you. For that. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jamie Dixon, for talking with me today about poems and revision and failing spectacularly and about Waffle House and all the many things you can get there. And it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. And thank you all for listening to the Mississippi Poetry Podcast, where poetry comes alive. <laughs> <laughs>